So starting. With... So I'm Brad Power, and I'm the host of the session today, along with Brian, who's going to moderate. This is the Cancer Patient Lab. Um, this is a community of advanced cancer patients who uh, have the pleasure of talking today with Ellie. Uh, just a couple of quick disclaimers we have up, up front. Our standard ones are, one, this is um, not medical advice. This is just information for you to take to your medical team and discuss with them. Um, and the second is uh, that this will be made public. Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. No, um, everything will be made public. So if you want to remain anonymous, uh, turn off your <clears throat> turn off your video, uh, put up an assumed name on the Zoom, and then uh, don't say anything. Uh, so with that, um, I'd just like to introduce Ellie. We've uh, been in conversation with Ellie for a long time because Count Me In is doing great work to allow patients to contribute their data to contribute to medical research. And also, um, uh, Ellie's an expert in prostate cancer, and we've started in prostate cancer. Many of our patients have uh, been uh, involved with Ellie. Ellie was very helpful with our good friend Bryce Olson when we had a uh, virtual tumor board for Bryce. And Bryce has been an inspiration for this whole community and for everyone here. And so he's deeply missed. Um, so that's how we got to know Ellie, which again was probably three, four years ago now. Um, and we've been wanting to hear this conversation about how Count Me In can help patients. And in particular, we're interested in the kind of any feedback that can be done clinically, because in the past, Ellie's explained to us that it's research use only, and it has to be sort of kept for that research purpose. But of course, as patients, we'd like to find some, some uh, you know, some uh, insights that can be personalized and useful to us in clinical. And that's that's the territory that Ellie will be discussing today, I hope. <laughs> and so I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Ellie. Great. So thank you, Brad, for the very kind intro. Let me um, share my slides. Um, while I'm just getting setting up, I, I took a slightly broader um, interpretation of the goals of this uh, session based off of um, the, the, the way the invite was structured. And so I will certainly be touching on count me in as part of sort of a larger conversation around wh what why your data matters and why uh why we're trying to make the most of it so let me um find the right thing here let's see if this works four years into this we should all have to figure it out by now um does that look all right yep yes yep. um, so, wonderful so thank you all um so it's a privilege to virtually be here and to present to this illustrious group and I'm privileged to have this uh, invitation to do so. Um, uh, I'm, my name is Ellie, as you heard. I'm a medical oncologist in, at Dana-Farber with a focus in genital urinary cancers like prostate cancer. I'm also uh, a computational biologist and run a research lab all at Dana-Farber and at the Broad. Um, there's our lab website in case you're curious or want to poke around what we do. Uh, my increasingly dwindling social media footprint on the right um, sort of Semi give semi retired uh, at this point, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, all my various titles. Um, the goal for this, uh, I'll aim for roughly twenty or so minutes, and then try to leave as much time for conversation. Is really around sort of in a forward thinking way, what what's happening in patient cancer data, and how is it being used to guide um, clinical innovations, which is a massive topic that I could never possibly do justice with. 20 hours, much less 20 minutes. Um, so I'll just try to touch on a few points and then leave the rest for conversation. Um, I'll try my best to keep an eye on the chat box, but it might be easier once I stop sharing screen afterwards to see it. So I apologize in advance if I missed your question. Um, I first, that, my... pardon? I can help you with that, Ellie. Wonderful, thank you. So here are my disclosures. Um, I thought I'd also give it, use this as a chance to give a little bit more background of, as introduction of who I am and how I got here. Um, so... Uh, I sort of trace back my sort of origin story to how I ended up in this field that I'm in um, to fourth grade. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles. So I went to this is a Temple Manual Community Day School. If any, there's one LA person I thought I heard. Um, there's a picture of me in fourth grade with a ridiculous uh, set of glasses. Um, this was taken from our yearbook that my mom dug up for me um, for, for purposes like this. Um, I remember being extremely bored uh, growing up. Uh, so there's most of my memories <laughs> just being bored in school all the time until um, one day when they moved this Apple IIe uh, into our, uh, in our classroom. 
And for me, this was sort of an intellectual awakening of sorts and got got to basically start playing with computers and I think um, really sort of set me on this course that I'm at today. Um, I went to college at Stanford and I studied something called symbolic systems, which is a mix of computer science with philosophy and linguistics. Um, it's basically a computer science degree and one very tried and true career path for people who um, go pursue this line of uh, uh, re, uh, of, of uh, academic inquiry is to go work in technology companies. Um, as you may have heard in Silicon Valley, or especially around that time in the world, there were a lot of them uh, exploding. Um, and it was a very exciting time. And that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, but as they say, a funny thing happened along the way. Um, some friends approached me, uh, interested in starting a nonprofit for supporting kids whose parents have cancer. Um, and that turned into something called Camp Kessa, and it's for kids whose parents have cancer. We started the first camp at Stanford in 2001. I'm very proud to say that uh, there's now about 150 of them around the country. Um, and it's certainly, I'm happy to point folks offline if anyone is interested in learning more about this program, which for me was a life-changing experience and sort of has sort of snowballed into why I pivoted into going into cancer medicine and why I'm at today. So... I, I was an Emma clinician. I'm a I'm a I see patients on Monday mornings uh, over at Dana Farber. Again, mostly prostate cancer patients at this point. Um, I was an Emma computer nerd, um, uh, and uh, you know, as, as you heard, basically have sort of figured out how to steer that energy into the world of cancer, um, and increasingly immersing myself into sort of the, all of the biology of cancer, but also the clinical opportunities in cancer and this interface of where effectively the patient is the model system that we want to study instead of cell lines in a petri dish, not mice, but rather human experiences. Um, applying algorithms to the high dimensional data we can generate from our patients to learn as much as we can from them and use it in combination with biology to maximize sort of the potential of how we can then act on these data to come up with new drug targets, new ways of matching the right patients to the right drugs, um, and hopefully changing the way we do cancer care. And this idea of clinical computational oncology is, in a lot of respects, a field I made up for myself because it didn't really exist when I was trying to pursue something like this 10 plus years ago, and is now, I'd say with, some, with a lot of excitement, um, you know, really snowballed as well into, into a field. And so with that, it's a bit of intellectual background. Um, I thought I'd give a background of sort of why we're doing um, what we're doing. And so the best way for me is to articulate this from some of my own experiences as an oncologist. And so this is actually, it's not a prostate patient, but rather a kidney cancer patient that I remember seeing as a first year fellow in 2011. Um, this patient had metastatic kidney cancer, that, so a disease that had spread from beyond the kidney to multiple other organs. This is a CT scan, this is not a test. So I will just help you by drawing a big red circle around um, a, a huge metastatic deposit that this patient experienced. Um, the life expectancy for this patient was zero to three months after having progressed on the, at the time, only therapeutics we had. Um, we got this patient onto a clinical trial, um, largely in sort of an ad hoc, not, not informed way, but just because of what we were able to find. This patient happened to get on, a, on, a, on an immunotherapy trial, um, which we didn't know back then, but now we know uh, works uh, like gangbusters for some patients, uh, but not all. And many years later, actually, this is a five-year scan, but we've now this patient is effectively cured of a metastatic solid tumor. Um, and this is what we're really trying to aspire to do uh, across the board. So with this is sort of like the real overarching goal, where does data come in and how, how does data potentially drive or accelerate our opportunities in these spaces? Um, one space is really around biological discovery. How can you harness tons of data and make new algorithms to find the patterns in huge amounts of cancer patient data to find new drug targets and understand why a disease occurs, why does it become resistant to the drugs we give it, and how can we then intervene? right? That's really at the core of the, on the really pure research side. But it's also potentially helpful for clinical evaluation. How do we figure out who should get what drug um, and where those, that sort of um, decision making should be uh, done and what kinds of ways can algorithms help guide this? And then finally, how can we do this in a way that's equitable so that everyone can actually experience this and not just a select few patients who happen to luck into a clinical trial or happen to be living near a big quaternary care cancer center, um, but really for everyone near and far, how do we do this? And 
how can we actually integrate sort of patient data, um, increase advances in especially artificial intelligence, which I know is sort of a, a uh, topic du jour that I think was requested I touch on here uh, to actually advance these three goals. Why, for whom, and how? These are really at the heart of everything we're doing in oncology. But this is, again, sort of a data-centered way into, into thinking about this. So um, we've been thinking about this a ton for many, many years. Um, one of the spaces we've really pursued aggressively is in prostate cancer. Uh, and I've actually had the privilege of helping to contribute to some of the largest prostate cancer genomics studies, where we actually do sequencing of all 20,000 genes, um, and we generate massive quantities of data from every patient that we can, uh, both the genomics of their tumor, but also the genomes of, of the patient as they were born, uh, and integrate all these data for many wonderful discoveries. Um, but one thing we realized is that we actually were pretty bad at actually understanding the genomics of the differences between um, tumors that were lethal and tumors that were not lethal. Um, and to sort of like frame the question in sort of a 30,000 foot view, what really we're trying to do, um, and really sort of tackle that why question, that biological discovery question, is we had organized over a thousand prostate cancer genomes. Um, and we wanted to figure out, is this gonna kill you or not? Um, and hopefully, you know, use that information, not only for prediction, but also to figure out what the genetic lesions actually were and, you know, make drugs for those things. And so increasingly, many people have been interested in taking this problem using AI. And so this is sort of a generic cartoon of, what, of an AI neural network. Um, the details are not important for the purposes of this talk. Um, and, but a lot of people are doing this. The problem with this kind of an approach is that these tend to be sort of like black boxes. You might be able to make an algorithm to tell you, you know, who, which ones are bad or not bad. But you're not going to understand why. Um, and if what you want to do is not only sort of do stratification, but also come up with new tar new drug targets and new ways of intervening, you need to know why. And so we have this idea that we could actually merge biology, the whole world of biology, that everything that's been over the last 100, 200, 500 years of everything everyone has known about sort of the way our bodies are put together and integrate that, engineer that into a neural network. And so we combine the two things up front. And instead of having these um, neural networks being sort of in, in a completely connected but completely uninterpretable form, we layered them such that you know, one layer was the genes and then the genes connected into pathways and the pathways connected into processes. And in this way, you actually would create a fully interpretable neural network that you could then not only steer at the exact same data set that I talked about earlier, and use it for sort of stratification and prediction, but also open that box and understand why. And so we actually did that in this context, um, use what we call sort of a biologically informed neural network based entirely off of data generated from cancer patients treated at a multitude of sites across the United States, um, found something interesting, did some experiments, and that's like snowballed into uh, phase one clinical trials uh, repurposing drugs that we knew were relevant for not prostate cancer, but now actually, because we just simply missed it, uh, actually think are relevant for a subset of prostate cancer. And this, in, in a lot of respects, is like how we can actually steer patient data and advances in data analytics to come up with new drug targets and new hypotheses that might help patients down the road. Um, in addition to sort of the why, we also want to figure out the for whom, right? And so there's a lot of really exciting data, data science innovations happening in that space as well. One of them is really around pictures. And so I showed you a picture earlier that's from a CT scan from a patient. Um, another kind of picture that is, is like very commonly seen in um, cancer care is pathology pictures. So when you the tumor gets taken out, the way the diagnosis is made is the pathologist looks under the microscope um, of the tissue that's been re removed from your body and tells you what they see. And that is effectively um, how the diagnosis is made. But these are all pictures. And in you know the data science world, especially with machine learning and AI, there's these kinds of pictures are already being used for all sorts of other cool things. Um, so for example, um, and those of you who um, live in certain uh, suburban, uh, certain urban areas have already seen self-driving cars out and about. Um, I was just home in Los Angeles for a family trip. And so I was struck by how many Waymo cars I was seeing driving around the city. Um, 
uh, but not actually struck by, but you know, you know what I mean, uh, metaphorically, not not literally. Um, and these are actually image processing problems too. And so a lot of this kind of stuff has already been solved, but has not been steered into, or solved in a technology perspective, but has not been steered into a cancer perspective. And so what we did was we took, again, a different kind of data from patients, um, in this case, cancer patients who have kidney cancer uh, treated with cancer immunotherapies. We apply these computer vision algorithms to parse the data into interesting representations of tumor biology, as well as the biology of immune cells and the microenvironment of these tumors, and use these two pieces of information to predict which patients are most likely to benefit from immunotherapy simply from applying algorithms to two-dimensional pictures. Um, there's other nuances of the study that actually relate these pictures to the genetics. I won't have time to go into, but I'm really just sort of providing a menu of sort of things that are out there. So we talked about why, we talked about for whom, what about, or we talked about uh, for whom, what about how? How do we do this in a way that's safe when equitable? Um, without going into the details, I'll just say, um, we have been developing paradigms for actually testing these algorithms in clinical care and figuring out where some of these newer data science strategies are useful, um, specifically in sort of a, in this case, using Google's algorithm for figuring out which patients with prostate cancer or melanoma um, uh, have uh, what's called germline or inherited genetic events that are actionable. But it also means coming up with ways to, you know, in in engage with our, our, our ethicists, uh, because this, this, this is going to open up a huge can of worms that we can go into in the discussion in terms of what this is going to mean for cancer care. And we need to think very carefully about how we do this in a way that's thoughtful and sort of doesn't harm people as we're moving this new technology into the clinic. So we talked about why, we talked about for whom, and we talked about how. Um, but I think if, I, if you take nothing else from this presentation, uh, I hope you get the sense that we're just barely scratching the surface of what's possible here. Uh, and so what do I mean? Um, well, um, you may start to hear in the press these things called foundation models, and we wonder, is there such a thing for cancer, generally prostate cancer in particular? So what do I mean by these? These foundation models are like, you know, things like ChatGPT or Dolly2. If you have not played with these kinds of things, I strongly encourage you to. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, but what they're doing is basically sort of a certain kind of AI that's built off of tons of data. Um, in fact, so much that maybe there are some legal issues, but that's a different story for another time. Um, but what you can do with these things is actually two at least kinds of fun tasks. One is, is you can validate existing concepts. So I can type a question about a disease that I have not thought about much because I do mostly prostate cancer into chat GPT, and it will give me an answer um, that sometimes is correct. And there's some huge caveats there. But what's perhaps more provocative is that you can actually use it to derive novel hypotheses and novel uh, insights that you could then test uh, in a way that would be impossible to scale in any other dimension. And so what's the chat GPT equivalent? Well, my, I sort of use this example of my wife who's a um, former professional tennis player and a Britney Spears fan. And, I, and she asked me questions about chat GPT. And I said, um, uh, you know, uh, she's like, what's the big deal? And I said, let me show you. And I typed in, to chat GPT, can you write a song in the style of Britney Spears about the top five men's singles tennis players? She's like, yeah, yeah, sure. There's no way this is gonna work. And of course, with it, as you guys probably know by now in 10 seconds, it spit out this thing um, and it was pretty wild, right? So why am I telling you this? Well, um, what if instead of like being trained off of words and sentences and books, um, we were trained off of billions or trillions of measurements from cancer cells, which we're now sort of scaling up to generate and could conceivably have in the not too distant future. You could then sort of query such a model to ask it to validate things that you know to be true and make sure that it actually is representing what you think it's representing. This is sort of a, a niche biology question, but more provocatively, you could ask things that, you know, for like the 15,000 or so genes that are not represented in the kinds of knowledge bases that are at the core of some of the algorithms I showed earlier, and have it generate some hypotheses for you that you could then have tested that could yield some unprecedented opportunities for discovery. What about translating this kind of AI into clinical practice? Well, there's a million examples. Um, one of the ones that's sort of near and dear to our heart at the Farber is actually 
using this information to match patients to clinical trials based off of their genetics, for which we have algorithms that are already in deployments, um, but actually pairing those with algorithms that go into electronic health record and finds patients most likely to um, not only be a match on the genomics for a trial, but also be at a point in their clinical care based off of the CT scans and other radiology information that they need a clinical trial. Um, so this, tr this actually, this study, this schematic that I'm showing here is already happening. It's ongoing at Farber, um, but it's really, again, just scratching the surface because there's lots of other data modalities that one could insert into these kinds of models, like sort of hinted at earlier. And there's lots of opportunities for making new clinical trials that can actually represent this stuff more, which is very exciting. But sort of to sort of snowball into where I'm trying to I'll, I'll end is really about safe and equitable cancer AI everywhere. And to do that, you need to not only have a lot of the downstream sort of technology capabilities accessible to everyone in a way that is sort of representative of the patient's experiences in the hospital systems and everything on one end, but upstream at the earliest possible point, you need to have training data that actually represents humanity, that isn't biased by the historical norms in our field, whereby we expect patients to come to us at one of a few select cancer centers to participate in this kind of research in the first place, but rather flip the whole paradigm on its head and invite any patients from anywhere across the country um, to participate in said research. And so I've had the privilege of being a part of Count Me In through the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project going all the way back to 2018, including some of the core initial advocates like Bryce um, and others um, to stand up this study um, called Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project or mpcproject.org. Um, here's the front page of the website. And so the way it works is patients click the Count Me In button. Um, they're asked to complete a survey and a consent form um, that gives us permission to access their information. It also gives us permission to ship patients saliva kits and blood biopsy kits. Um, so the saliva kit helps us to understand the genetics that they were born with. The blood biopsy kits help us actually to understand the most current status of their tumor genetics as detected by you know, the tumor genetics that is shed into the blood. And we can actually have folks send multiple of those kinds of kits. So we can actually get longitudinal information about disease course. Uh, we generate this data. We make it as available as quickly as possible. As was alluded to, this is a research project. Um, so we are actually, from a regulatory perspective, unable to return individualized results. We can come to that back to that in the conversational piece as to sort of why that is and what we're trying to do about it. Um, but for now, is this a research project that still ideally helps to feed this sort of broader goal of helping us discover new biology that might help everyone everywhere. Um, here's our current map of participants, a rough, roughly current. Um, we have over 1,100 men. Um, we have all really representation across the United States and into Canada. I think we have all 50 states at this point. Um, I should double check that uh, before I, I, don't, I don't, don't, don't quote me on that one. I know this is, this is being recorded. Um, and we can do some really interesting things, uh, like not only understand sort of real world data at one time point, but really study tumor exp uh, patients' experiences to different therapeutics and match their sort of tumor evolution and do some really cool inference on down, downstream. Um, so this was really intended to be uh, sort of a, a broad overview, a quick snapshot. I think I, sorry, I went over by a few minutes. I apologize. Um, but really want to end by saying what's the goal of what we're trying to do is, you know, do some biological discovery with this. I hinted at one application, but there's just so many. It would, it, it's, it's, it's such an exciting time because there's just so much cool stuff happening in this domain. Um, make better ways of integrating this into clinical care um, and then doing it in a way that everyone can access, which is I think really where Count Me In and sort of the projects like it are at, at a unique space to really um, impact the, the field writ large. Um, and obviously connect the dots between everything together and sort of our, the royal we, uh, including all of you on the Zoom, um, people near and far, if we actually want to sort of make this happen, I think we, we, are, we as a community are uniquely powered to do so um, and set the future of, of, how, of AI, data sciences and everything else in, in oncology across the board. Um, so many things to be continued, um, but I thought I'd end by just, again, thanking the folks in my lab I get to work with, the entire Count Me In team, um, some of whom are on this call. Uh, it's really a privilege, again, to work with this team um, uh, day in, day out, um, folks near and far, uh, various funding sources. There is our lab website and our uh, social media handle, um, and maybe I'll just stop there um, and um, uh, maybe use the rest of the time for conversation.
Great, Ellie, thank you so much. I know that was a daunting task to uh, encapsulate all the work that you do. Uh, and you have a very broad audience here. Uh, you did a great job. Um, so what I'll do is just um, ask folks, if you have a question, please use the uh, raise your hand feature in Zoom. Um, it'll pop up here and I will call on you. You also can ask questions in chat and um, I'll try to get the, to those as well. Um, I know that there were some uh, questions uh, from Rick Stanton, uh, co-founder, uh, regarding RNA-seq and liquid biopsies. So Rick, do you want to uh, get us started? Uh, sure. I think you answered many of my questions uh, as you went along. Um, but for uh, your your initial cartoon of um, AI, you, you used the ver uh, genes that were depicted in terms of mutations. Yes. And, and uh, you know, I, I've been a <laughs> big fan of uh, immunotherapy since it came out and uh, trying to predict response uh, from RNA-seq from the tumor microenvironment. Um, but I imagine you use that as well. Yes. Yeah, so it's a great, great point. So I think the, the, the model that I showed was based purely off of the In some sense, we, in the field, we call it, it was a toy model. It was a, yeah, it was a, right, it was right, a toy right. model that snowballed into a nature paper, which is like always, you know, on the academic side, that's great. Um, it was just like version 0.1. And so us and many others are experimenting with different data modalities, inputs, transcriptional information, not just sort of bulk RNA sequencing data for which it is hard to actually attribute exactly what cell type um, the signal is coming from. So is it tumor cells? Is it immune cells? Is it other cells? Um, but single cell data, which I was alluding to in one of these pictures, um, where you can really do all that. So that's actually just the start. Um, but yes, these models are flexible for this. The, the biggest problem with these models, the, the biggest like sort of philosophical limitation is that it's built off of prior knowledge. And in the end, you, you bring a, your glass half full empty kind of person, we only know something, and even that's incomplete about, let's say, depending on who you believe, three to 5,000 genes of the 20,000 genes in the genome. And so these models are incapable of going into the complete unknown uh, that are not represented in sort of pri the prior knowledge domain. And that's, I think, where the foundation models might actually be particularly interesting to explore um, in a way that you know, we would, would, if we didn't have these kinds of technologies, it would take us like a million years to sort out uh, the old fashioned way. So I'll say I could be wrong, um, but that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I had one other point uh, that I don't I don't know the answer. I'm completely flabbergasted. Uh, my buddy got a, a liquid biopsy result. Uh, I think it was uh, well, it'll either be from uh, Garden. I think it was Garden, and it, the reports had a 78 percent uh, variant allele fraction, and I thought that seems really high to me. Uh, how could that be? And I trying to grapple like I, I really don't know about shed dna and and i would have to think that most of the shed dna yeah. is coming from a tumor rather than a normal cell to get that kind of uh variant allele fraction high rate do you have any interpretation how, yeah. how can... it's a it's a it's a tricky one i mean here's one one thought that could be so vaf is variant allelic fraction so it's the abundance in, in the, if if one is considering what are theoretically tumor sourced reads, um, uh, it's the abundance of the mutation, let's say, in that reads. And so normally you'd expect if it was a sort of typical mutation in a in in a where you just needed one mutation to cause a problem, you know, you have two copies of every gene in your genome. You'd expect the VAF to be max 50 percent. You know, it was some error mode, right? And so how do you get above that number? Sometimes it's if if it, there's certain kinds of genes that instead of the mutation turning it on, yeah, the mutation is needed to turn it off. It's called tumor suppressors. And there you actually need to lose two copies. And so sometimes what happens is, is that one copy of the gene is lost by a big deletion, a chromosomal deletion, let's say. And then you have a mutation that kept the other, the other copy. And so in that way, with some error, because it's also picking up normal cells and other, it's like sort of a bit gets a little bit muddy. You end up with something above fifty percent, somewhere in that range. Um, so that's at least one explanation. It would be hard uh, 
I mean, I'd have to see the whole report to sort of know. There's there's a few other sort of niche ones as well, but uh, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be surprised if, for instance, this was a so-called tumor suppressor um, that w you, for which you're actually looking for uh, two hits. Um, and yeah, yeah, okay. But even approaching fifty, like, wouldn't you get most of your uh, shed DNA uh, from normal cells from the blood? Oh, yeah. But so in, in principle, they're um, uh, I mean, again, then this comes down to each each company is doing their own thing, um, how they're filtering and how they're sort of like zooming in on what they're looking at. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think through extreme scenarios, like sometimes men who present with de novo metastatic prostate cancer and have a PSA of like 10,000 have, have a pretty extensive shed tumor burden in their blood. But I think I, I'm guessing they, they do some um some computational work to sort of address for some of that without without knowing the details. No. Thanks. It, was, it just was bugging me. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. Thanks. By the way, before we go on that, I just I, I the folks who um it always warms my heart to see some some folks uh, participating in Camp Kesem. Uh, I I I must say, having been there from the beginning, it is what is never endingly wild to me. Uh, that this thing snowballed into what it became or has become rather uh, knowing, knowing where it began. Uh, <laughs> so it's wonderful to hear. And I hope it's a, uh, it's been a, it's been a good experience um, uh, um, for those who participate. Yeah, that's great. Uh, good to see that your early work continues on. <clears throat> um, David Plunkett. Yeah. What you described uh, when it comes to uh, uh, training data, uh, sounded an awful lot like uh, what I was uh, encountering through the Promise program. Do you have access to the data that they've accumulated? So we're trying to work to get some access to those data. Um, you know, some depending on the project, sometimes it can be, there's a variety of regulatory reasons that can make it difficult to access things in real time. Um, and that's also part of the historical norm of sort of the way research has been done. Now, I would just say sort of, again, give a shout out to the Count Me In folks who had sort of on the day one ethos of make data available as, as quickly as we can keep up with the generating and analyzing it, um, independent of any one person's research agenda or one organization's research agenda. Um, it's, it still has challenges just to keep up with it, but we've tried to do our best. And actually, some of the fun of those kinds of things has been seeing people use the data, cite the paper, and we didn't even real. We have no idea who they are, or what they're doing with it, and that's actually the whole point uh, of what we're doing. So um, we're work working with the sort of folks at the intermediary with where the promise study and what and others like it are doing these kinds of things. But you know, there's there's a bigger actually there's a bigger uh, data sharing problem. That's you know we, we all want to share data and we all want to access this to make it useful. The royal we, um, it's actually very hard uh, from a regulatory perspective to do so. So uh, I will say you know. And this is sort of a um, uh, shameless, I uh, get to pat myself on the back for getting to do something. Uh, last fall, I got to go, uh, I was part of a panel for the United States Senate. Uh, we're educating the senators about AI and th this panel was AI and cancer. And in the end, um, they asked us all like, what was the, if you could fix one thing, like what do you fix? And basically all of us on this panel was like, I was the academic, there was somebody from Google, there was somebody from Tempest, there was somebody from some other independent research lab and Ned Sharpless was moderating and Ned's the former NCI director. And every one of us basically said, if you guys could help simplify all the rules for data access and, and you know, patients are demanding this, but we, we are, our hands are, we, we will get in serious trouble with the current rules. And so, you know, there were some smiles and nods from the senators and, you know, they're busy with other things right now, but uh, maybe one day uh, they'll fix that and make it easier to share data in the first place. Anyway, that's that's a semi-related tangent and a rant that I that I always like to have. So certainly, if you ever interact with any of your representatives, you let them know that you'd like your data to be shared if, if that's something you care about. Anyway, okay, I think, I think we we all care about that for sure. <laughs> um, Jeff Jeff Krolik. Uh, we lost you, Jeff. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Jeff. Um, no, he's uh, with us this morning. Um, so I have two somewhat related questions. Um, from a uh, patient perspective, it sounds like you have very granular uh, kind of uh, data, or you can get down into uh, uh, very fine details. 
Um, at what point might this be able to really be individualized? You know, here's my data set. You run it. Uh, what are the um, possible treatment options um, for me rather than looking at the aggregate and, you know, uh, uh, this and that. So that's one question. Second one is um, many of us also weigh with any treatment options, um, you know, what are we willing to do to stay alive basically versus, you know, side effects and quality of life. And uh, if you're not, that's an interesting, it's not just overall survival, but it's the quality of that. Um, is there a way to capture that um, with different, uh, you know, as you're really going through all of this to see which treatments are somewhat effective or very effective and provide uh, maybe the best quality of life and the fewest uh, side effects? So those are two great questions. Then the first, uh, <coughs> interpretation, um, you know, the sequencing vendors that provide them try to provide their interpretation too, right? And they try to tailor therapy. Right. The problem with those things is they're static in time. And, you know, frankly, they, they're, there's literature on this, like they're hard to make them representative, right? Like, you know, they don't, they don't know you and they don't know where you live or which trials you have access to. And they'll put on, like, I've seen a bunch of these from patients where it's like, you know, you patient lives in Boston, like, Oh, our thing recommends a study in Seattle. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, it's simple things like that even. Um, and, and, or they're not up to date. Um, it's a really hard problem um, to actually do well uh, and correctly. Uh, well, actually, I will say shamelessly, We've been thinking about this from a computational perspective. There's an example from one study that has a method that includes a portal where you could conceivably upload your data, if, if you know, which is still not super easy to use, admittedly, um, and run this method. It'll sort of try to give you some clues as to what, what's actionable in your tumor. Um, the trick is, though, this is like a research-only tool, right? And it comes back to the prior conversation about what is research and what is clinical care um, and who gets to do what. And so there's a a lot of uncertainties there. Um, we're we're experimenting with some ways to try to overcome that angle, um, but uh, it's it's a it's a complicated space still, both from a technology perspective, but also from an implementation perspective. Um, on your second point, around sort of other information, so that's actually a really interesting one. So in in our in our metastatic prostate cancer project study, we had built in these patient surveys. Um, that included a lot of questions around supportive care, other kinds of things you're taking, you know, and other stuff. And that's actually, um, you know, in part driven by patient feedback as we were building this project saying, you know, they, they read the notes that the doctors write and it doesn't even include a lot of the stuff they're telling in the first place about these things. Um, and so if it's not included there, it's never gonna get measured. If it's never gonna get measured, it'll never be able to be included in some of the things that we wanna ask questions about down the road around which ones have some of the, a lot of these issues uh, sort of connected in, in some other way um, with everything else and which might, you know, which is a problem. And so um, we're certainly encouraging more and more folks to speak up and speak out and contribute that kind of information when available. And with the hope being that that might help us guide not only sort of like decision-making from a purely biology perspective, but also holistically as part of like the whole patient's experience. There too, again, I would just say from being self-critical as a, as a provider, as a, as a medical, as a physician, I know we, we still struggle with this and struggle balancing a lot of those things. So certainly a lot of work to do there as well. Thank you. Brad, you've got your hand up. Yes, thanks. Um, Ellie, as I sort of alluded at the front of this, a lot of us are interested in how you can use the data and the information, the AI, the algorithms, the insights for individuals, which Jeff just touched on a moment ago. And I think Frank and Al, who are teed up behind me, will also touch on. Um, I understand why you haven't been able to do it to date. I think in the past you told us it would be very hard to return results and very expensive. Are there any... So the, the vision is 
we want to find patients like me. You know, has anybody who has my profile yep. done similar things and what were the outcomes? And that might steer me to this treatment versus that treatment. Yep. Are there any efforts underway given as you have pointed out with all of the energy going into AI with uh, customized chat GPTs and, and so on, um, what are the efforts underway that we could lend our energy to that are doing the things that we want as patients where the beneficiary is the patient or the doctor, let's say, deciding for an individual versus for the drug discovery or for broader insights into population level information? Yeah, so how do I, I use it to help me? Um, and I told, and that, I'm sympathetic to that being a, a major need. Um, within the Count Me In organization, we actually have a, a one project that's part of a actually a, a National Cancer Institute consortia where the return of results is mandated. And it's being being used as like the sandbox to, fi to figure out all the nuts and bolts of, of all the problems. Because there, there's many challenges, one of which would be, you know, for instance, if, pa if patients are driving it, then they're effectively inserting me, um, Ellie, let's say in prostate cancer, in, Ellie who lives in Boston, inserting me into the clinical care of thousands of patients around the country, uh, which is a very complicated thing <laughs> and stressful for whomever takes that on, but also on the other end for the providers, the teams, and it creates a lot of uncertainty, a lot of like things that need to keep track of. So it's, it's, it's a bit challenging to do it. And, and you know, especially if the goal is to actually come up with real-time treatment decision-making, which is an even more complicated um, element. Um, but we're trying. And similarly, locally at Dana-Farber, we're, we're trying, we actually have some projects that are in real time in my lab and in collaborations where we're taking um, our local data. So like unstructured electronic health record data from you know many thousands of patients um, and their genomics and building these sort of patient similarity algorithms so that you can find how similar you are to other people, see what other people, what happened to them and what was done, and then use that knowledge to guide care. Um, that's sort of a real time, that's the precision medicine goal that we're actually building now. Um, the tricky parts become when you want to do that everywhere, right? Um, there's a lot of challenges to um, moving these met, met algorithms, that testing whether they generalize, um, a lot of biases related to sites, sites that are specific to them. There's even aspects related to which trials are open where and whether they're relevant for X, Y, and Z. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's still a very hard problem. Um, you as the patient have access to a lot of the same portals and data sets that we do. Um, there's a great one, for instance, CBIO portal, which count me in data have deposit their data into that is uh, navigable and not does not necessarily require being an, a super wonk to, to play. It's got a GUI, you can play around with it um, and is a place to start. Um, getting into the weeds of the more sophisticated things. Uh, in my opinion, I, I have not seen anything that's so ready for prime time that everyone should be trying or using it, whether a commercial or in an academic setting. But I think that's where we're all, we're all heading towards. Um, but it, it said it, 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 it creates a lot of the same questions and problems around access and equity um, and bias um, and whether these models actually um, can generalize and tr be translatable such that like even if we built that perfect patient similarity thing and we're able to sort of match you to others and do this for people here, um, would that translate, you know, to somebody in the Midwest on the West Coast? Would that even translate to Boston Medical Center, uh, which is you know three miles away from me, um, but is a very different medical environment? Uh, I don't think we know the answers to those questions, and I think there's a we already have seen in the AI world in particular enough examples of where it's already gone bad. Uh, to give us pause, or at least hope, I hope give everyone pause to think about how we're going to do this carefully. Um, that That's that's my two cents. Thanks. <clears throat> Frank. Hi, nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, the, the talk today. Um, I, I actually had maybe a bit of a follow up to that, um, you know, to where we were kind of ending at the end of that question. Um, you know, when you look at some of the research that you're doing, like the, a lot of the work in the AI for drug discovery place, you know, very important, but it's, you know, very long range, very high risk, high reward. 
Um, what are some of the things that you see as research that could come out of a data asset like this that will have, you know, short term, you know, could have short term patient gain, you know, because it seems like this is going to be like a really valuable asset for, you know, forward and reverse translational work. Um, some of the, you know, some of the things that you were showing, like the work around the uh, TIL prediction from slides, that that feels like something that might be a short term, yes. you know, something that could be diagnostically actionable. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious what you see there. Uh, that's that's my first question. I have, I have a second question. Oh, yeah, go it's ahead. A little, little, uh, oh, it's it's a little unrelated. So maybe let's take that. Right. Um, so I would just say, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Like, the reverse, the sort of like biology discovery side of things always has a much longer arc to impact. Um, you know, all that work yield, leads to, let's say, maybe a target, which is step 1A of making an actual drug, a uh, step 1A right. of like a like 1 billion step <laughs> process. And so it's very hard. And I there's obviously people who would love to shrink the timelines, but even in the best case scenario, it still takes many years. Um, so yes, and that's why I wanted to highlight some of the other examples that are much closer to being shovel ready. So whether it's like the digital pathology space for which there's, you know, in addition to our own research, there's like commercial vendors already setting up shop yeah. doing uh, not the stuff we're doing, but rather stuff for more diagnostic purposes for pathologists. And then likewise, the precision oncology sort of patient stratification matchmaking kinds of things for which, you know, we're not the only ones thinking about this. There's, there's lots of energy happening there. And you could imagine those things becoming um, quicker to hit um, the clinic um, in hopefully controlled, testable environments, uh, but but it'll hit the clinic before, well before, you know, like in most cases, well before you, you find the drug. Now, as a counterpoint to myself, um, uh, I would say, you know, in that, in that example, we actually used all that retrospective data and found a drug target that actually already has drugs that are all, already in clinical trials. It's just that they weren't in clinical trials in prostate cancer. And that's actually a huge shortcut. Um, and to try to find something that was missed um, by our own accord and then flip that around becomes just as quickly intervenable as some of this other stuff. But, you know, how many of those examples are there? I don't know. Probably not not a ton. So um, I think it's all fair. Right, right. And you, you do definitely see like good examples of like line extension, you know, like you think about like what, you know, Katruda is now available, yes. essentially, you know, kind of more or less across the board. Um, I, I did have a second question kind of on the regulatory side. Um, you know, you mentioned that there are, you know, you see some pretty substantial regulatory issues to blocking data sharing. Um, I, I was actually kind of curious to hear about that. And I, I'd love to hear like what you see specifically, because, you know, definitely if like you if you collect the data in clinical practice, um, HIPAA itself provides like pretty straightforward, you know, involved, but straightforward ways to make the data shareable for research reuse. Um, is this kind of like a problem or with like the funding model? Is this kind of, you know, for instance, I know the NIH and, you know, C, you know, inside of HHS, the NIH and their human subjects policies are different from, you know, kind of what what plays in HIPAA land. So I was curious to hear, you know, what, what do you see as like these specific yeah. barriers that need I to mean, be addressed? So I think HIPAA is is it just like any other thing is interpreted is has a layer of legalistic interpretation that is very dependent on who you're talking to where when and why and so um and then likewise when you're if you're conducting research um to actually even if it is to eventually inform clinical care if it is research then there's like much big layer and then you add on top of that where laws start to get a little bit fuzzier about what's colliding with what you know uh, what's identifiable information? Um, are, how are protected are your genetics, for instance? Where does that? How does that get managed and controlled? And it, like before you know it, um, it's like you see it in the way we our consent forms are created for patients, and they get they keep getting longer and longer. Um, they never get shorter, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and that's a reflection, I think, of the um, of the inherent problem. Um, in addition to that, I think there are um, you know, you know, people, and then the conservative nature, people are always anxious to pull back, you know, protections because like people, mm. you know, understandably get upset about these things and there's a lot, there's risk there. Um, so it's, it's always, it's harder to pull back things that are already happening. And then 
people are reactive. And so when one bad thing happens, then people add more things on top that oftentimes have lots of other problems that just, again, just make everything harder and harder and harder. Um, the counter though, I would say, where patients have a unique opportunity, and I've been on the soapbox for years and it's gotten me nowhere so far, but I'll just stay on the soapbox is, you know, you as patients have via HIPAA right of access, the right mm -hmm. to call up every hospital you've ever been to and every commercial sequencing site you've ever had any data generated and whatever, and demand your data. And not just some sort of stupid little PDF with a little portal, everything. And so we actually did an experiment with some patients, including Bryce, about five, six years ago, where we had patients call up genomic testing companies, invoke HIPAA right of access and say, I don't want just some my PDF report. I want the raw data. And what we learned was that we caught some companies off guard. They had no idea what we were talking about. Some companies wanted to help, but they didn't know how. And so in one case, actually maybe even Bryce's, the company, I won't name, FedEx the thumb drive of his genomic data to us, like no context, not helpful. Some companies intentionally prevented access, effectively knowingly violated HIPAA because they don't be like, what are you going to do now? And so, so then we wrote this thing up and then a Forbes reporter found us, called us and put a title of an article and called us data pirates. And then my mom called me up and was like, what the hell is this? You know, um, uh, it was a fun experiment to try, but it, I think it proved the feasibility. Because let's say tomorrow, a million cancer patients at the same time called up their hospitals and said like, hey man, give me my data. I want to give it to these like these crazy scientists over in Boston. You were going to do some AI on this or give it, you know. Uh, and if they all did that, well, you'd break the system, certainly. But then all of a sudden, all of these things go away. Because the in the end, it's very clear what the patients can do. And once you have the data, you can do whatever you want with it. You can staple it to your forehead. You can send it to us. You can, you know, put it on the moon, you know? Um, and so that's that's Ellie's um, provocative, um, you know, call to arms. I've never been able to successfully get any research funding to support going from that initial pilot phase of like five of my friends to let's actually scale this out a bit and actually see if there's a there there. Um, and I think it scares some people because there's some, you know, profit motives that are get destroyed based off of like that kind of a principle. But, you know, I haven't given up entirely on it. I just uh, haven't figured out the right way to do it. So anyways, that's my I'll get off my soapbox. But it's a great question. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. Oh, yeah. I'll, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll follow up with you offline to, yeah, sure. on, that, on that last point. So appreciate Thank it. Thanks, Frank. I uh, just want to be mindful of time. We've got about four more minutes. Um, Ellie, if, maybe if you can hang on, that'd be great. If you can't, totally understand. Yeah, I, I do. I can say maybe for a minute or two extra, but I, I have a I have a bit of a packed day today, so I will have to run. Yeah, um, yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, Al Masella. Hi, uh, I'll speed it up. First, uh, we have a patient navigation program for brain cancer right now that kind of does what you said was tough to do. The way we get around some of those problems is we just give a list of recommendations to the patient and their doctor and they make the clinical decision. So we're not really yeah. setting up a clinical relationship. Second, we could automate the gathering of all that information you talked about. What we need from the patient is their consent. And then our back end, which is run by XQRs, they could go out and gather all those medical records you talked about and you know, sift them into using artificial intelligence structure the data. Um, my point I was going to get to is we were talking about equity. We're working on a project to be able to get the uh, the trouble that we have is we give these patients these ideas of what would be the best clinical trials, for example, and none of them could get into the clinical trials because of location or whatever. So we're working on a way to get these treatments to them outside of clinical trials. You know, the obvious answer is expanded access, but that's not like a large scale solution. That's you know one-offs. So we're working on a way, and I think you might be interested in this and we can talk about it later, the Promising Pathway Act. It's a new law that would give us access to the all these experimental therapies, but it changes the whole system, whereas it's basically a distributed clinical trial where everybody could get access to these treatments, but they're within a clinical trial using them until we gather enough proof to get it approved that it graduates to a full approval, say conditional approval, basically. I mean, That sounds fantastic. Actually, I, I'm mindful of a patient I, I had, I have, uh, with a metastatic bladder cancer, 
who I, I had to, and I remember this because it took forever, basically beg, borrow, and steal via a bunch of forms and a bunch of pleading and a bunch of everything with Merck to get early access to pembrolizumab for this patient back before it was, we already knew there was signal, but it exactly. was That's the type of drugs we're talking exactly. about. And, and I was, I was able to get it after a ton of work. Um, and I'm, you know, this, that was like in 2015 and he's 2024 and he's alive and well, uh, effectively cured of a metastatic solid tumor, which is remarkable. Um, you know, I, 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 which is great, except as you said, it's a huge pain administratively and really challenging and impossible to scale. So what that you're describing there sounds exactly. fantastic. And, and the thing that we didn't do is like my end of one is a nice story. And yeah, it's we're not tracking it. Our we're, system not learning. Exactly. System. we're not, we're not we're learning. learning and right. Exactly. And so but by, by forcing it to be structured somehow, so we can all learn collectively. I'll send you an email about it because I know we have one minute and we have great. other people. Okay. I, I have um, one question. Um, so, you know, our patients at the Cancer Patient Lab have access to a number of different service providers that can sequence their information and interpret it and then provide treatment options. I, for one, have used several of them, come up with 21 different treatment options, and then, of course, worked with Raina. Who I know you know very well, um, and she spent the time to actually review all of them to figure out what was best for me. But what was interesting is there's no concordance, or there's no concordance across these three different vendors. So you have an interpretation challenge. Um, I'm just curious if you know for patients that are that are on this call and that will listen to the recording, are there sets of data that um, that we really should be focusing on that can be predictive or that can really identify targets that will make a meaningful difference? in their treatment uh, decisions. For example, whole exome sequencing versus proteomics versus transcriptomics versus spatial phenotyping. Yeah, you know, there's just a myriad yeah, have, of these different tests, yeah. right? A great question. I think at this point, you know, if you wanted to be really cynical about it, even most of the genomics is still not ready for prime time. And even for the things we find in patients, have known about for decades, we still don't have drugs like P53, which is sort of mentioned in the chat. Um, this is not a new cancer target. It's just an old one that everyone knows about. And we just like, have no idea what to make, how to make drugs. And so, you know, so we move on. So if that's sort of the baseline, a lot of the other tools, which I'm very familiar with in my research lab, you know, fancy schmancy spatial transcriptomics, very cool, do lots of interesting, ask interesting questions, lots of cool biology. I think it's very much cart before the horse of like, how is that going to tell me which drug to pick with with confidence? Um, that's tough. Um, and so I would say, you know, uh, at least like today, um, and, and you can speculate and hypothesize, and I certainly do, and my, you know, we all do. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to stack or rank the tech by what's gonna immediately help me today, that's a tough one, but a lot of these things, which are cool and really exciting technologies, I'm not, I have you know, it becomes the newer they are, the harder it is to be clear how useful it is. Um, unless it's tailored to an existing therapeutic or companion to a therapeutic that's already in development, which most of these are not. Um, so that, that's my possibly mildly controversial hot, hot take on that. But uh, um yeah. So, the, so the diagnostic space is just is moving sort of like at, at light speed, but it, yeah, yeah, the 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 pairing or the matching to to drugs that are going to be effective, the data is just not there. Is that so fair to say? The difference, yeah, like it, it's sort of like for me, like the 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 mental, it's it's mentally jarring for me flipping between my clinical and research brains. On my research brain, it's like I'm looking at you know spatial transcriptomics and single cell data of like millions, billions, trillions of data points on all these high dimensional this, and we're doing all this crazy stuff. Clinical brain, it's like, all right, I'm doing Lupron and Docetaxel or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lupron yeah. or Abby. Like, it's yeah. like, it's like, I have, it's like yeah. uh, this or that, you know? And and like, yeah. what do I have to guide on those things? It's, it's right. a completely different scope. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I do, totally. And so the goal, right, the, where the data comes in is, is you build a bridge. Uh, that's, yeah. that's and you fight, and you and you also build new bridges. So that's that's the, that's the long term goal. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, Ellie, I, I know uh, you're, you stayed a few extra minutes uh, late. I appreciate that. Um, 
This was a phenomenal conversation. We would love to have you back because I know that we just scratched the surface. Uh, maybe we'll find a way to kind of uh, hone in on some topics that um, uh, can continue this conversation. Uh, but want to thank you again and thank all the participants for joining. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday at our next session.